Uh, speaking of do-gooding, uh, your, your website's excellent, actually, JethroTel.com. There's a number of things on there that people can contribute to, get involved with. Haiti was the obvious one that, that stuck out, but there's other things. Well, you know, there's stuff like that, but it, it, it is... Um, I'm, I really don't like telling people where they should... Um, you know, they should put their money to a good cause just because I might have. You know, I don't think that's a... That's you know, it do, doesn't make me feel comfortable, but, but if you are making people aware of a problem they might otherwise not be so aware of and not, and not know how to go about being, uh, being generous with their um, little bit of surplus cash, then uh, sometimes it's good to tell people. But I, I'm not very comfortable with it. I, I, think, um, I think doing charity concerts is, in a way, the nicest way to give something back because, you know, what you're giving is your services or, in my case, usually having to pay a lot of costs. You know, I quite often think that a lot of the charity concerts I do, it'd be easy for me just to write the cheque rather than assemble road crew and staging and sound and lights and all the rest of it to do a show, which, which has to be paid for. But, you know, we all, we all know too well about the charity concerts where the costs of putting it on are almost as much or even greater than the, than the money that's uh, um, raised in ticket sales. And, in fact, nothing goes to charity as a result because everybody's clamouring to get paid. And, of course, people who supply sound and lights and trucks and buses and all the rest of it they they, they don't get it they, they, they don't get the glory of pat on the head for doing good charitable works even if the musicians or the main man does and so they have to be paid they don't they don't they don't cut special deals in fact i have first-hand experience of situations where i know when there's a charity event that there are some suppliers who, th who think oh someone's subsidizing all this so we can jack our prices up even oh, more and that really does happen which is quite horrid but it um i right after i speak to you i have to go and talk to a couple of my crew because of uh, of uh, sourcing a, um some sound and lights for a concert in uh, canterbury cathedral our most famous cathedral in the uk which um which i'm doing a concert in december and um you know these are issues trying to find uh, suppliers who are going to at a busy time of the year not uh, not rip you off but at least stay within the bounds of you know normal pricing so we we, we have to organize all of that and although it seems december seems a long way away but in fact you know time marches on and you've got to put your name down on various goods and services to get things organized so that's what we have to do has the business of making music changed dramatically in your career, and, and how do you assess the environment now? There have been a number of technological changes which have really been the, um, the big moves. I, I don't think fundamentally music, the sound of music, the kind of music, the directness of contemporary rock and pop music, I don't think that's really changed a great deal. I mean, a couple of marginal changes, but the changes have tended to be driven by technology uh, as it, that has given new opportunities to new people uh, in the way that they make music. And, um, you know, if we go back to the time of, of Leo Fender and Les Paul, you know, when they originated the, uh, the guitars that won the West, then um, those were big technological changes which, which spawned rock and roll. You know, if it, if it hadn't been for those instruments, then we wouldn't have had what we call rock and roll. And um, subsequently, in the latter part of the 60s, early part of the 70s, we saw the beginnings of, uh, of uh, analog synthesis of sounds, purely electronic instruments that sounded maybe a little bit like something else. And then, uh, towards the end of the 70s, when digital technology started to develop, we, uh, we saw um, the, uh, the beginnings, first of all, of processing equipment that was digital in nature, and uh, subsequently, in the early 80s, the beginning of computers and music, and, uh, and uh, digital sampling of real sounds. And so those, those technological developments really brought about so many changes, which... Uh, changed not only rock music but but perhaps more importantly in a way gave a lot of young musicians the opportunity to make pop records in their bedroom and um, computers in, in, in music have been 
both a, a blessing and a curse. But I think uh, you know we have them. We have to use them, and we we all use digital technology one way or another. And you know all the stuff out there. There might be some speakers driving molecules of uh, in the air, and making you uh, tremble in your seat. But there's a whole lot of digital processing, a lot of digital stuff happening there that is um, uh, isn't necessarily a hundred percent. You know, obvious to the listener, but but it's it's going on. We we've kind of got used to all of that, just as we've got used to the the huge benefits of having internet access and dressing rooms and on tour buses and whatever else. So business kind of goes on 24 hours a day in the music industry these days. You don't have to uh, stop just because uh, you've run out of quarters to put in the, t- <laughs> the telephone, <laughs> which used to happen, you know, back in the in the days gone by. You yeah, know, the you, phone booth you, is you, almost you obsolete, of course. You know, you'd be going, you're tr- trying to do your, your work, you yeah. know, doing interviews, you know, phoners, the radio station is sticking quarters <laughs> in, a, in a call box backstage. Was it? Years ago, uh, Rod Stewart was given a device, uh, when you're standing at a microphone, spread your legs, Long John Baldry said that, you look much cooler, and Rod thought that that was a great idea, and he still talks about it. Has anyone given you advice that stuck with you and, and, and was meaningful? In your career, uh, don't don't remember any. But then, I think Rod Stewart, who obviously is a, an icon of some sort in the world of pop music, he's uh, um, you know he is a poser. That's what he does. He, he's he's that kind of a performer. Um, I think the more idiosyncratic and off the wall people like Joe Cocker or me, you know, don't really think about what we do. We just do stuff, you know. We're not trying to look cool or, or impress the girls, you know, or the grannies, you know. We're, we're not out there to do that. We, we just kind of get on with what we're doing and just things develop as a, a way of performing which seem um, in keeping with the expression of the music. I mean, whether it's Joe Cocker waving his arms around and looking like some kind of weird, demented, pop it on a string or whether it's me standing on one leg and <laughs> popping about the stage then you know these are just things you, you kind of do you don't really weigh it up and start analyzing it's that intuitive. it intuitive it just happens yeah i think it's just something that you start doing and it feels like a natural extension of the music it just adds to the expression and um but i do rather imagine that it may well have been in the case of Rod Stewart or some other people that they actually do practice quite a lot in front of the mirror kind of <laughs> trying to look cool you know to look good I'm and, sure he's beyond that but I'm sure he did it 19. Yeah. <laughs> well Rod's never had a great legs anyway I mean they're actually first of all they're rather short and uh, secondly they're kind of even for someone who's mad about football they don't they don't they don't look they don't look like footballers legs <laughs> He's a footballer on stage, but that's just a few balls to the fans. Yeah, well, I, I remember going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland and being absolutely appalled in some glass case with these two little mannequins that looked like they were about four foot tall, and one was wearing Rod Stewart stage clothes, which just looked impossibly small, and next to it was a mannequin wearing my stage clothes, that was obviously something I donated to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame many years ago. And, and between Rod Stewart and me, either, either we were actually very, very small when we were in our heyday in the 70s, and we've actually just grown into normal human beings <laughs> since then, or there is the faint possibility that we both used the same very dodgy dry cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> it went into the dryer and that was the end of that. Yeah.